Hey guys, it's Doc from The Gold Hog, and this is going to be part of a series of sort of classroom stuff that I'm going to work on over the next few weeks. I'm going to break it up into segments, and I think what I'm going to probably do is cover two subjects in each one of these videos and focus on two things so that it doesn't go too long. But the first thing I want to warn you about is if you're looking for some entertainment video, if you want to see some prospecting, we have 92 other videos. This isn't the video for you because what I'm going to do is I'm going to put down some thought processes, mix that in with a little bit of science and sort of try and get some points uh, across to you and open up your mind a little bit. Now, also, you're going to see a gold hog sticker back here, and that's not advertising. It's actually the cameras don't like to focus on this whiteboard, and you may see them blur in and out. So I have to put something here to try and get them to constantly focus. So if you see me pausing also, it's because I'm looking at a different camera trying to get it focused. But I want to have one camera here and then one camera here to sort of focus in and get a little bit closer so you can see what I'm writing. The next thing I want to talk about real quick is one thing I try and do, and I try and do this in just about every video that I do is, is I don't try and talk smart. In other words, there's a lot of science that goes into what I'm doing here. And I'm not going to throw out a whole bunch of scientific terms and get real complex to try and impress you or to make you think that I'm smart. I talk very, very plainly. And that's something I'm going to stress here. I'm gonna, there's a bunch of science. You're going to a bunch of rules and different things that apply to what I'm talking about. When I talk to things like settling velocity and laminar flow and all this kind of stuff, but I'm not going to go deep into that because it just messes with your mind a little bit. There's no reason to do that. I think I can explain it pretty simple and pretty basic, but there are, there is a bunch of stuff that applies to this. So I'm going to pretty much deliver this in straightforward talk. Okay, now let's talk about, before we start this series, and this is uh, the first one that I'm doing, is I want to talk about one thing real quick, and that is the principle of reflection. And it's a human nature, and I want you to understand this one point. The principle of reflection. Let's say every day you drive to work for half an hour, and you drive down a busy highway, there's two or three lanes on this side, two or three lanes on the other side, and you're driving uh, a, a Ford F-150. And you're driving and you go to work every single day. Thousands and thousands of cars, if hundreds and hundreds or thousands of thousands of cars, zip by you both ways. So you're passing cars, cars are passing you. You have two or three lanes coming this way and you're going to work every single day. You do that for half an hour, you do that almost every single day, five days a week for three years. All of a sudden you trade your, your Ford F-150 and let's say you trade it for, let's say, uh, I don't know, um, a Hummer H3. So all of a sudden you're driving a Hummer H3, even though they stopped making them. Well, what happens? Well, all of a sudden, the first day you get on the road, you start to see other H3s. You'll see them not only in your lanes, but across the street, coming by you at 65 miles an hour. You'll see them a quarter of a mile away. All of a sudden you'll spot one. You know what? That same car has been driving by you every single day for the past three years. You've passed that thing hundreds and hundreds of times and you didn't even see it. But why did you see it? It's because the human eye only sees what the brain understands. And that's the principle of reflection. You may see something and it might be right in front of you, but until you understand it completely, the human eye doesn't recognize it or doesn't see it. That's the principle of reflection. So, you may be doing some of this and not even know it or is happening in front of you. And until someone points it out to you and say, hey, this is happening, your, your eyes won't see it. And hopefully that's what I want to do with some of this stuff. So one of the first things I want to talk about is I want to talk about incremental processing and incremental exchange. Now, this is not a known term. This is actually a term that we came up with and we coined um, because we saw it consistently within sluices. Some people call it, they're, 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 some people have referred to it in the past, but I don't think they've explained it or, or actually put it in such a term, terminology, that you could understand it. And let me explain what happens. Now this is going to refer mainly to, um, mainly to a high banker situation, but it's in every sluice it happens. So I'm going to draw you a sluice. So here we have a sluice. And you, let's say it's a high banker. So you have a header box here. Your sluice comes down. You have water that's coming in here. And then you have dirt that's coming in here. Okay? 
So what's going to happen now is, is this mixes up and it becomes the slurry. The slurry falls directly into here. Well, what you're going to have is you're going to have obviously a series of riffles. So let's say you have a riffle here, riffle here, riffle here, and a riffle here. And we're going to call these R1, R2, R3, R4, and R5. And it goes down. When your slurry comes in, when your slurry comes into your header box here, everything mixes up and it's a very heavy concentration of, of actual sediment that's inside of this. So this is your sediment and also it's known as a sediment rate or feed rate, how fast you're feeding that. So you have material and water coming down slurry and everything is dropping here. Well, all of a sudden it starts to move forward. Well, what happens? Well, you have a vortex right in here, obviously. You have a vortex and these all have vortexes. And as the material comes down through here, this riffle will load up with material. So what I'm gonna do is, is as the slurry comes down in green, this will actually load up completely. You'll actually see this load up. Now it's gonna load up with a couple different things but it's going to load up with light materials, it's going to load up with heavy materials. At this point, they really aren't separated that well. So you're going to have everything in here. It's going to, your riffle is going to look really full, and when you first drop it down, it's going to look really light colored because you have a lot of light sand and quartz. But because you have water flowing over this, you have an energy, you have an exchange pattern going on, what happens? Well, this starts to work down, and as it works down and processes and exchanges, what you're going to notice is that that light, that that light, all that heavy light material starts to exchange out and starts to get darker and darker and there's less and less and less. And that's your processing or exchange pattern that's going on. Now if you do this, if you dump, if you keep an eye on it, if you watch it, once you dump this, depending on the water speed or velocity of your water and how quickly your vortex is moving, there'll be different time patterns on this. So if you have a real high velocity and if you have a powerful vortex and fast water moving down it, your exchange pattern is going to be actually kind of quick. And it may be, let's say, one to three seconds somewhere there. If you have a slower one, it may even take somewhere between two and five seconds to really work down that first riffle because it's heavy loaded up. So you drop it down and you sit there and watch it and it'll exchange and exchange and exchange and pretty soon all of a sudden it'll get down to a normal point where you're sitting there with maybe you're just holding heavies behind that riffle. So let's say one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000 three seconds, and that's a pretty fast exchange. So let's say three seconds. If there's three seconds, well, when you dump your, when you dump your material in here, your slurry is coming down and your slurry is traveling really fast. So it's traveling down about that speed. So your water's coming down, your slurry is coming down. Well, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. Think about that. So one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. If this riffle is filled up, what happens? Well, everything, including the gold, the heavies, and lights, are going to come down and pass this riffle once it fills up, and they're going to go down to the next one. And now this one is going to start to fill up. So that's your incremental processing. So once this fills up, now everything else will go to the next one. Once this fills up, it'll go down to the next one. That will fill up. Go down to the next one, this will fill up, and you'll actually see that some of these down here will be still working when this one up here is maybe clearing out a little bit. So it incrementally loads and it incrementally exchanges. If all of these are full, let's say they're all full right now, if all of those are full and you still have sediment, you still have a slurry coming down, what happens? Well, what happens is, is everything, there's no space for it here, so it goes right out the end, okay? So, now these are full, you don't have the open exchange pattern in here, so now it can actually ride down, and that's where you're gonna create some losses. So, when you hear about sediment rates and feed rates, and matching it up to your sluice, the exchange rate, or the incremental processing, that's a very important step to understand. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we work on that? Well, number one is, is managing a constant sediment rate is a really good thing. So a slow sediment rate that allows for an exchange to happen. The other way to do this is a lengthen your sluice. 
so you can have a longer sluice. So as you feed, if you need more incremental spaces, instead of having five, you may go to 10, you may go to 15, and that's why a lot of people, if you look at it like a long tom, a long tom is the same sort of principle. It's, it has a longer processing. So as it's processing and exchanging, it has a longer path to go down. That's why you'll see a lot of long sluices. Even in our products, you'll see a lot of long sluices because we have very high, very high velocity, fast moving water, and we want to be able to feed that at a high sediment rate. And to do that, we need a lot of those incremental exchange patterns. So when we talk about incremental exchanges, this is what I want you to keep in mind. I want you to understand, and you can watch this for this in your own sluice, but when you dump, you're gonna see this riffle fill up. As it fills up, there's still material going by it. Same thing, this one will fill up, there's material going by it. And if your whole sluice is filled up, guess what? Now you have, actually, I call it kind of a ski bump where everything can ride over this and actually exit your sluice if there's not open exchange areas. So that's why every single piece of equipment is different. I get a lot of people that say, well, what should I use? What size, what water flow, what matting? And it's almost impossible to say, to say really, unless you actually see it. That's why so much, especially when I work with commercial operations, I really wanna see, I wanna see that sluice running and I wanna see the sediment rate. And there's so many factors that are involved in this that you want you, you get it nailed down, you're good. But it really takes a lot more thought than just what riffles am I using and so forth. So that's, that's incremental exchanging, and I hope I explained that well enough. Let me clean off my board a little bit. Now we're going to talk about, we're going to do a little bit about settling velocities. And settling velocities uh, basically means how long it takes for something to settle down. So if, um, let's say you had, let's say you had um, light sand and then you have gold, and those two are moving, moving. How long does it take for that fine stuff to actually, moving through the water, it actually sort of falls down to the bottom? Because eventually, if it's slow, if it's slow and calm, eventually things will start to settle down, and they'll settle down to the bottom. But on settling velocities, every, everything within your sluice that passes through sort of has a different settling velocity. And even though it's all gold, it'll have a different settling velocity based on its overall size, mass, and shape. So a flat, small piece of gold will have a totally different settling velocity than a round, larger piece of gold. Round, larger piece, boom, it's gonna drop down. A one millimeter sphere of gold will drop through, uh, I think it's three feet of water in right about one second, 38 inches. So bing, it, it's at the bottom, it settles extremely fast. But there again, you can get really fine, fine gold, and even some of that flat gold, that if it's moving and it's moving through fast water, that it's not gonna wanna settle a lot. And if you keep introducing turbulence to that, it's actually, once it tries to settle, it's gonna come back up. So this is kind of what we're gonna talk about this. And the first thing I want you to understand, and this is important, is that there's three loads within a stream or within your sluice. So we're gonna call this, we're gonna call this the actual bottom. And what I mean by bottom is either on a stream bed or even in your sluice. So this is the bottom. Then we're gonna have three different types of loads. The red line is gonna represent um, your bed load. Typically your bed load is larger material, heavy, larger material. So we've got maybe larger rocks, larger gold, so forth. The next layer is gonna be what we call the sediment load. Sometimes they even call it suspended, but I like to call it a sediment load. So now you've got a sediment load. And your sediment load is things that are a little bit lighter, a little bit smaller. So maybe it's real fine sand, maybe it's super fine gold, smaller things that aren't as dense and have a greater mass that wanna fall out real quickly. And then the last one is gonna be a dissolve load. I'm gonna put real tiny dots up here. All right, so what we've got here is we've got a dissolve load, a sediment load, and a bed load. So those are the three. Again, dissolve, sediment, and bed. Now, if you know anything about 
I guess we'll go ahead and I'll say, if you know anything about laminar flows is that within a stream, and let me draw this. So the water's coming towards us on this stream. The fastest flow will be in the center towards the top. That's gonna to be your fastest flow. You're gonna have a so, slower flow on your sides, on your bottom. They're gonna be a little bit slower. And then in between here, you're gonna have layers. And I mean, a lot of people, I like to explain it, it's often been explained, it's like playing cards. They're sort of, these, those layers can actually sort of slide and move at different speeds. But the reason why we have a slower layer down here is because there's resistance, there's a little bit of drag. So you have along the sides and along the bottom, things are moving a little bit slower. And in the middle and upper towards the top, that's gonna to be your fastest flow. So knowing, knowing that this lower flow down here is a little bit slower anyways, plus what we're doing because it's a bed load, which is larger material, it's larger rocks and larger gold, means that it's really going slow down here. So it's slowing down. The real heavy stuff that wants to fall is just falling right away. That's your bed load. Then you have a sediment load. And your sediment low is smaller material, maybe really fine gold, um, maybe you know fine quartz, a lot of clays, mica, little uh, silt, that kind of stuff. That's really what's carried in your sediment load. Then you're gonna have your dissolved load. And the dissolved load is basically, it's so microscopic that it's really not gonna, has almost very little weight to it, and it's really not gonna settle down. It's just gonna stay without the, within this whole system and just sort of just flow through. It's not really heavy enough unless it was, comes to a stop. Once it comes to a stop, there is no movement, then it will gently sort of settle down and water will clear up. If you ever had sort of mud in a, mud in a bottle, you shake it up, it's all it just sort of stays there. You come back the next day, it's all settled down. And that's what I want you to think about the dissolved load, so that muddy bottle water. Sediment load, sediment load would be like really fine stuff that you shake it up and all of a sudden it's still there and it's slowly falling and slowly falling. The bed load, if you were to put rocks and gold in a bottle, shake it, put it down, boom, right away it's down at the bottom. So it really what we have to do is we have to worry about where's our gold within these three layers. Obviously, uh, once it settles down, gold drops very fast, most of our gold is gonna be down in here, okay? So it's gonna be down in our bed load. This is where the majority of our gold is gonna be. However, if you have a very fast, very turbulent situation going on, you're also gonna have a lot of fine gold in this sediment layer. So you're gonna have fine gold within the sediment layer. And what's gonna happen is, is this fine gold over time, again, the heavy gold immediately wants to drop down. So there's an immediate drop right here for the heavy, for the heavy gold. It just wants to drop. And you'll catch a lot of gold under your header box and in your first riffle, okay? A lot of visible gold. But what you're gonna see is the sediment layer gold is gonna to wanna, to, is gonna to wanna to come down a little bit later, depending on the velocity and speed of the water. So it's gonna to wanna to come down a little bit later. It has sort of a pause fall. So as the water's moving, heavy gold drops down. Your finer gold, it's gonna drop, but let's picture an arc. It's gonna drop slowly on. And up here, we don't even worry about this upper layer. What we're really concerned about are two things. We're concerned about our bed load and we're concerned about our sediment load. And there's a couple ways you can look at this. Number one, if you create a bunch of turbulence in here with large riffles, so if you were to put a large riffle in here, the water's gonna flow over this, the fine gold's gonna start to settle, then it's gonna hit this, and get what's gonna happen? Well, that fine gold is gonna be thrown up again. Now, is there a possibility that the fine gold will be pulled down into this vortex? Sometimes, but a lot of times it's barely settling and it's not gonna be pulled in here. Heavier, medium, size gold, no problem. That's all gonna come in here. It's this fine gold that wants to sort of just take its time settling that you're worried about. So I'm gonna draw this again. Make it bigger. Here's a riffle. Here's the bottom. As the water's coming through, the water pattern's coming here hitting here, going up, creating turbulence, 
and coming down. And you can actually see this in your sluice. If you look at your sluice, you'll see that water hump up. And what you're doing is you're creating turbulence. This is quite a turbulent little area in here. So as this gold wants to settle, again, the fine gold is gently settling. It's being thrown up and some of it will be caught down here. But a lot of times it's not enough depending on the speed of it. This is where fine tuning of a sluice comes in. But some of it's not gonna wanna come down here. So that's why a lot of times you're gonna hear people talk about um, a good thing to use is expanded metal, uh, raised expanded metal, because there isn't much turbulence in that. So that's a good product to use. And it's sort of where we came out with our matting system, where if you look at the majority of our mats, they run very smooth, but there's all kinds of little small spaces and exchange patterns. It's sort of a 3D. So instead of just dealing with this floor pattern, now what we're dealing with, we sort of remove this. And what we've done is we've altered the stream bed. So we take this right here. This is the normal stream bed where the majority of material is coming across. And what we've done with a lot of our is, uh, mats is we've given a false stream bed. So what we have now, let me blow this up, is I might have a pattern something like this. And that repeats. So as the material, the bed load and the sediment and everything's wanting to come down, the heaviest stuff that's riding now settling along the bottom is actually falling out, exchanging and going along. But you'll notice something, and what we haven't done is you'll see that this water line stays like this. So we create very little turbulence. And that's one thing we're looking for. So like in the UR mat and the Razorback mat, even on the Razorback, I might have a small little riffles along here, but you're still gonna see this water here run very, very smooth. There's very little turbulence inside of it. When you run our scrubber mat, as an example, on the scrubber mat, it actually has, that's actually not bad, it actually has sort of a smooth pattern to it. So the water will come up and smoothly do this. In other words, it's not an abrupt flow, and you may see a little bit of a hump here in that water pattern, but there's not a lot of turbulence. So we lift up those loads, we lift up the bed load and the sediment load, and we allow the, the heaviest stuff to fall first and be worked by these patterns down here. Now there's another way that you can look at this too, and this is interesting, we've been playing with this a lot, which is cutting the sediment load, which is what I like to call. So let's say we have our water flow here, and instead of, let me draw the bottom, and here's our base load, instead of creating a throw pattern, like a traditional riffle, where the water hits and throws up real high into a vortex, what we're doing now, and some riffles actually do, this is what's called a cutting riffle. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove this. And actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a cutting riffle. And what ends up happening is um, you end up still having a little bit of a bow here, but as your sediments flow into here, this is a very, very sharp, this is a very, very sharp cutting edge. And this cutting edge here doesn't create a big pattern. It's a very small, gentle pattern, but this sediment load actually gets cut, and this gets pulled down very quickly and into an exchange. Yes, you're gonna have maybe a slight hump here on this cutting, but it's not a real turbulent high throw up situation. But this is a good example on our river hog where our river hog, there's two ways to cut it. This is the cutting, this is the cut. So the water's flowing this way and you can see where it cuts the water and pulls it down in. The other way to do it is, let 
there's one cut. The other way to do it is a throw, like this. So your water's flowing this way, water's flowing this way, and what you'll see is, is this is a cut pattern and it's a very, very powerful vortex back here. You're not going to see, it'll look really clean behind it. There's not going to be a lot of material because it's so powerful and so energized. On the other hand, when you have this throw, what's going to happen? Well, if you put the throw one here, it hits it, it's actually going to throw it up. You're going to have a little bit larger hump and you're going to have a throw pattern and you're going to have a, a softer, bigger vortex behind this one. And your actual capture pattern will be a little bit different behind that. And actually in some of our larger dredges, what we do is we do an alternating pattern on this. So what I'll do on some of the dredges, and especially we really pitch them up steep, we run the water as fast as we can over them. And what we do is, is we alter, based on the velocity and turbulence, we alter the height of this riffle and we alter the cutting pattern. So what I'll do is, I'll actually come up here and I'll put a throw, leave a space on the, in the next mat, and then I'll put a cut. So as I go in with my river hog on my dredge, I'm gonna have a little throw riffle and a cut riffle. Now I warn you that I'm cutting these riffles way down. And I'm gonna draw that for you in a second and explain how I do that. But this is a real good pattern for a very high energy. The other thing is, um, I always try and put in our equipment, I try and put at least one or two of these cutting surfaces, a little bit of turbulent combined with a non-turbulent surface. So instead of just an exchange surface, I also want a little bit of turbulence, and I'll tell you about that in just one sec. So let me show you how, as an example, we in one of our, let's say a big five inch dredge, and we're screaming water down it. So what I'll do on my pattern is, I'm gonna blow it up for you is I may have a throw riffle, and then further down, I may have a cut riffle. And these are spread far enough apart. So when the water comes up, the water is flowing over this. And what ends up happening is because I have a cut riffle after this, anything that is still up high this sediment load gets cut and pulled down behind it into a real sharp vortex, exchange vortex. And we're seeing super, super fine gold, and I'm talking way down below 50 mesh. We're talking 100 mesh gold, 150, and even 200 mesh gold screaming through a five inch, and we're catching it up here. And I know we're catching, we've done extreme tests on catching 100% of our tailings and testing it, and I'm catching a lot of that super fine gold up in the top 30% of our, of our um, dredge. So I know, that it's, I know that it's working well. We've caught 100% of our tailings on a couple runs and tested, and you just see minor, minor, minor losses. So this is a good pattern for a dredge, and I also like to see it incorporated into a regular sluice. But again, I wanna see you cut it down low because I wanna see this, it's hard to do it, but I wanna see this at about 50% of your water depth. So if your water depth is only an inch, you gotta cut this way down. Now on the river hog, <clears throat> the river hog has a ramp to it. So you have a pre-ramp on the river hog, then it has a space, it's a, actually a rather complicated space, before it comes up to this riffle. Then it drops down, and I'll probably put up the river hog pattern on the screen so you can see it. And so what it does is it gently lifts this before it hits this cutting surface. So it lifts the bed load up and right before it hits that cutting surface, there's an opportunity for gold to actually drop in here. It's sort of a dead zone. And we see a lot of gold in this pre-ramp right here. As it comes up, it hits this and we see a bunch of stuff back in here. We see these things filled, absolutely filled with fine gold. And what's amazing is that you'll shut down and you'll see even larger rocks behind here. But because it's so active in there, the gold gets pulled down and just works its way into these grooves. And you can't see it till you wash it all the way down, all the way down, all the way down. So a lot of people want to talk about settling velocities and the one thing that they, they say they don't want to create any turbulence in their system, but we've, we've proven through extensive and indefinitely finite testing that 
you can manipulate you can manipulate those settling velocities based on varying patterns and that's why really what I like to see within a sluice is I never like to see a sluice that's set up with all the same matting in other words don't put just UR matting or just don't put riffles you want to introduce different things the other thing you want to know about your sluice system is the velocity zones so your velocity zones and this will be a full another video we're going to talk about but let's say up onto your header box so this is your header box here's your sluice you're going to have a zero velocity here so your velocity will be zero here because the water is falling straight down and you can treat this like a fluid bed under here and that's what we do we put ur mat and punch plate we treat this like a fluid bed and then the water starts to pick up speed so you have a 1v velocity of speed one and as it goes down your velocity increases velocity increases and so what we do is, is we we change our we change our matting and we change our capture thought processes throughout the different velocities of the sluice and we're going to talk about that on another video about reading your own system because that involves a lot of stuff it's not just how many gallons per hour you have it talks about the velocity it talks about different capture zones and so forth but I did want to throw in one little thing on this video and we're going to do something we're going to do another video about floating gold but one reason a lot of people say well I don't want to create turbulence because I don't want to lose floating gold when in fact uh, that's actually kind of counterintuitive because actually that's kind of how you stop gold from floating there's three ways to stop gold from floating and again this is a full another video but there's three ways to do it number one is heat If you have hot water, the surface tension is lower. It's not really an option for us as prospectors to heat our water. Number two is a surfactant. So if you have a surfactant, such as jet dry, something that'll actually, through a chemical process or through another substance, will actually get rid of the surface tension, okay? That's another way to do it because that's why gold floats. Gold floats because there's surface tension. The third way to do that, what's the third, what's the, what's the last option for us? The last option to stop gold from floating is actually turbulence. So those are essentially one, two, and three. These are the three ways that you can stop gold from floating if you have a sluice. We can't heat the water up because we're, we're miners and we're out in the middle of nowhere. Surfactant, you really, if you're running any kind of, if you have a recirculating sluice, you can do it, no problem. Um, you can use a surfactant, but if you're like everyone else and you're just running, pulling creek water and running it out or whatever, you can't use a surfactant. So there is one way you can do this and fight floating gold, and that's turbulence, because surface tension goes away at a very turbulent point. And what I mean by that, and this is just sort of a general thought process, is that for gold to float, and most people say, wow, this is, I got fine gold and it's floating, they have it in their pan and they touch it down to the surface, the gold comes right up and floats. Well, is your pan water turbulent? No, it's very still, it's very soft, it's just like a little pond, and when you go down and touch, you have very high surface tension, and that's why it's going to float. But if you put in at least one turbulent zone in your sluice, you will stop losing floating gold. So in other words, and I don't care what, what you use, but let's say this is your sluice. And let's say you're using, uh, maybe you're using all vortex matting. Maybe you have uh, um, a long tom that you're running and you have expanded metal miner's moss, or even if you have our mats in there and you're all running real smooth. But places like Arizona and places, especially where you're putting real dry dirt in, that's, that might be one of the only places that you really have to worry about floating gold. But all gold can float. So what I like to see is if you have this smooth surface, everyone says, well, slow your water down and make it really smooth. Well, all you're doing is assisting that floating gold to actually keep floating. And what you really need to do is at one point have a cutting edge. So you're allowing the gold, you've had all this time for this gold to settle if there's a piece of floating gold here, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create one point of extreme turbulence where that water surface tension is completely broken and the floating gold can, will actually be resubmerged, and it works. Now, this is stuff we've actually tested. And so that's what I wanna see. So if you have a long sluice 
And your long sluice is actually, and a good, great example is this is a lot of commercial operations. A lot of commercial operations will have large expanded metal or catwalk grate, um, and they'll have, under that, they'll have miner's moss, and you'll see it, and they'll run it, and they'll run it for 30 yards, and that's the way they run it. And it's actually kind of stupid, to be honest, because you're, what you're doing is, it's kind of the definition of insanity, where you're repeating the same thing over and over and over and over, all the way down your sluice, but yet you're expecting a different result, and it's not going to happen. So what I like to see is, is one, at least one interruption point. So I'm letting my gold settle all the way down through here. And, and instead of just allowing that same process to happen, I'm going to put in an interruption point. And this interruption point may be just one riffle. Maybe it's a riffle every four or five feet if you have a big, long commercial sluice. But that interruption point will actually create a real strong exchange. So if it's coming down, you've got miner's moss and you've got expanded metal all along here we're gonna hit it with one turbulent point and get it pulling back down. Then you're gonna go again. And what you're gonna see is, if you have a commercial sluice, you're gonna see a lot of gold, obviously, and you're up here, up under your first riffle, second riffle, third riffle, you're gonna, or, or area in the mesh. You'll see a lot of gold up here, but then what'll happen is, and the gold starts to disappear and gets less and less and less as you go down, but if you do this right here, if you put in one turbulent zone, one small riffle across that, what you're gonna notice is you're gonna notice that you have another gold build up right here. And it's not because of floating gold, even though it does eliminate all your floating gold, but one thing that you're gonna notice is that you've exchanged, you've changed out an exchange pattern. So yeah, maybe this wasn't working so great, and now you've offered one little ramp. And I don't know why more commercial operations don't do this, and they really should. They really should look, and it really can be something simple as just a little piece of L bar, uh, L -bar that sets on top, very, very small. Um, maybe even half an inch of steel, just an, L -bar, just an L bar in there, just running across there that creates a real violent sort of turbulent, a real violent vortex right in here. But that really works well. We prescribe that for a lot of commercial operations. But a lot of commercial operations, um, what we do is, is they say, well, I'm running expanded metal and moss here, and I want to use your mats. Really what we do is we say, don't battle yourself. And let me explain that real quick. This is something else I want to touch on before we finish up today. <clears throat> on commercial operations, a lot of times when I work with them, they say, well, we're at a 70% or 80% capture rate, which means we're losing 20% of our gold, and we're wondering if your mats would work better. Well, this is what I say to them. Um, why, why fire the guy that's doing a pretty good job? So, if you have a commercial sluice, and this is at 80%, why fire him? Don't fire the guy that's actually already doing 80% of the work. What we prescribe for a lot of places is change your pattern. So if you're repeating, 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 and you're still losing 20% of your gold, number one, either your sediment rate is too high, or number two, it's the principle that, you know, it's the definition of insanity. You're repeating the same thing over and over and over, and it's just not working. So what we do is we actually have our commercial ops actually put in an after sluice. And that after sluice is an extension. So maybe they have 20 feet of this pattern right here. What we'll do is we'll actually have them come in and put another 10 feet in here with our matting system after that initial one. We increase the velocity, we put a different mat pattern in there, and what they end up seeing is that they still keep the 80% that they've already caught, but now they have a sluice that catches the 20% that they're losing. And it's kind of what we do with our products. If you look at them, our products are long, so we want to make sure we've got lots of fast water, lots of exchanging, plenty of open areas, but we like that long thing so we can feed heavier. Now, you, a lot of prospectors don't understand, miners do, but a lot of prospectors don't understand that a lot of commercial operations are running 12 hours a shift, and they may want to run even longer than that. You may have operations that may run two or three days before they actually shut down and clean out. And to do that, you have to have a really good open exchange system. Once you start clogging this up after the first hour or two, you're gonna to start to have stuff riding down it. And that's why you really wanna have an open exchange. And the nice thing about this is, is you can actually speed this up because now you've got an after sluice down below to catch with a different capture, uh, different with our matting or a different zone. And we do this now 
Um, we have a couple commercial lofts, and we actually have built, and you can, they, we've even got one up that's just built it out of wood. They actually took a wood sluice, and where the water that slurry would normally exit out of their sluice, they actually have our matting system in there in a, in a wooden sluice, and they run, they run, they run, they catch it, and all of a sudden, any of the losses that they have are sitting in that extra sluice. Works out really well. Okay, so I hope I talked enough about settling velocities. I hope I covered some stuff. I hope I opened up your eyes. But the main thing I want you to think about today, in summary, is that number one, there's three different loads. You have your dissolved load. And dissolved load, we really don't worry about. What we're worried about is we're worried about the sediment load and we're worried about the bed load. These are the ones that we're worried about. And the big one that people really stress out about is the sediment that has really fine gold. So if you're really moving water fast, if you really have a big turbulent thing, yeah, you can have sediment losses and that's where you lose some of your fine gold. If you have a really short sluice, and you're moving water really fast, you can also have this because of incremental processing. So understanding the sediment load and the bed load is real important. Incremental processing and exchange, that step down process is really important to understand. So you have to understand that, hey, my sluice might not be long enough for my feed rate and sediment rate. So controlling your sediment rate to match your sluice bed and your incremental processing is important. You want to have open zones all the way through there. Makes a big difference. If you have any questions, we're going to be doing more of these little classes later on and hope to have them pop up pretty soon. Thanks, guys.